I've got a charge cube behind me. This thing's full of recycled old electric vehicle batteries. And this thing can be taken to different locations around the UK, dropped off and charge up to 12 electric vehicles at a time. This place is fascinating. Let me show you around. This is Charge Cube Cubed, the little three. Cool. Um, I'm going to show you what's inside of it. So inside here we have our large inverter, which this will do 63 amp three phase, so quite powerful, it's 50 kilowatts. And then got some really clever VCUs that basically do all the communication with the Tesla batteries that are hidden just in there. Two Tesla batteries in here are giving us 150 kilowatt hours. So we can stack six of them up inside of here. Then either side, we've actually got a charger. So we have a seven kilowatt charger embedded in each side of the cube. And then just here, and you've got your connections and everything inside there. So these plug into each of your chargers, basically. Yeah. Um, and if we go the bigger charge cube, you have basically have multiples of these to daisy, daisy chain off to the really cool pavilions, which I'll show you now. Oh, the door's magically open, so you can see all of it. Look at that. Yeah. And then up there is a uh, full liquid cooling system. So the batteries are all liquid cooled with glycol. So we basically run the pumps every 10 minutes just to make sure there's no hot spots within the batteries. We have the pavilion. These are my favorite because it's basically like a miniature sea container. You've got a little LED light, charger either side, daisy chain in, and then basically you can just plug this straight into your Tesla. That is called Bruce, is it? Bruce, yeah. Yeah, and literally just plug it in. Sweet. And away you go. That's I can that button. And you've got a little channel behind you for, for the- Yeah, so the table. channel runs along there. It just, it means it's semi-permanent but it's all classed as temporary. So from a planning permission point of view, yeah. no planning permission required. So this is seven kilowatt charging at the moment on this. Yep. Uh, but we can go up to the bigger chargers uh, with the CCS and stuff in other variations of the cube in the future. Right, so I'm here with uh, Chris Hazel. So you are in charge of the charge cube, I yes. understand. So tell me a bit more about it. Uh, so charge cube is a rapidly deployable charge infrastructure device, but it's, it's in a sea container, it uses Second Life batteries, so Tesla, BYD, VW, whatever sort of available. We've, we've reverse engineered the battery management system so we can bring them online and they stay as the complete battery pack as they come out of the car. Cool. So we're not taking them apart, which makes it a lot easier to build. So they're just like piled on top of each other? Yeah, Sorry. yeah it's just basically a sled of batteries and you just stack them up so you can go from like 150 kilowatt hours to 450 kilowatt hours in the same unit. Yeah, so, th so the one we've got outside then, that's just yeah. a small container, but you also do a larger version? Yeah, so that one will do up to 450 kilowatt hours in that size, and then we do a 20 foot, which is about a megawatt worth of power inside that. Um, yeah. But the megawatt one's more for DC rapid charging, so you'd have like 240 kilowatt chargers on it, for yeah. DC rapid charging deployment and stuff like okay. that. Okay, so, so I guess um, the biggest question is, what's the use case for it? The reason we've developed it is we started looking in the EV space and going, well, charge anxiety seems to be the biggest thing. There's nowhere near enough chargers and fleet are causing a sort of, they're, they're, they're not complaining, but there's electric vans now coming onto the market, but none of the fleet operators actually have charge infrastructure. They all rent warehouses like we have here, yet they don't own the warehouses. There's not enough power available from the grid to actually come and do it. So in a lot of situations, it's they've either got to pay for a massive new grid supply, which can cost hundreds of thousands of pounds to put in mm -hmm. on a premises they don't own, which just seems absolutely crazy because they might leave there in five years. So the big plan yeah. charge cube is drop it in, have up to 12 seven kilowatt chargers sort of set out from it. Hmm. And then you can charge your vans overnight and then use them in the day. But the benefit is, is you have to have a 450 kilowatt hour version. You could put a 32 amp three phase grid supply in that's always on 24 hours a day topping up. Hmm. And then that big battery with that supply overnight would give you like eight hours of full power from those units yeah. over, overnight. Yeah. So that's like a, that's the big benefit with it is to just enable sort of industry to start using electric vans or vehicles yeah. readily and there's no charge infrastructure excuse for them. That's brilliant. So you're filling in the gap of uh, the charging infrastructure that isn't quite there yet for the companies that let's say they lease uh, a property somewhere yeah. and then you can just dollop one of those down for them for a year or something? Or is that the plan? So you yeah, it's only a year or it might, it might sit there for five years. It yeah. depends on sort of how they do it. And also there's that thing of a lot of these companies like, oh, electric van's going to work for us. There's still a little bit of pushback mm, on it. So it, yeah. with this, is they can they can do it for, you know, a couple of months, year, five years, 10 years, but they've always got a thing that they've, they're renting it or leasing it. So yeah. they've also not got the worry about maintenance. So we do maintenance. We can go and make sure they're looked after, that if the cables get damaged, they get replaced. If someone knocks into one of the pavilions, we can yeah. fix it. So they've sort of got that side. They know they've just got a reliable solution sat there all the time that they can use. And if for some reason EVs aren't the future, then they can yeah. just, you know. They haven't built out the infrastructure in their exactly. area and for, yeah. for a waste of time. Yeah. It's just crossed my mind, only just now, <laughs> that when you take one of these to a, to a, a place, uh, 
you just plug it in yeah. and then it would just slowly charge yeah. all the time, yeah. but just discharge quickly yes. to all the cars. That's exactly. I've only just gone through my brain yeah, now, so, so it, how are these things going to charge yeah. up? So if you think you've got, uh, if you say you have a 32 amp three phase supply, that will do three seven kilowatt chargers. Yeah. That's nowhere near enough, but most companies haven't got much more than that a spare power. So you put mm -hmm. that into something with a big battery pack and then you can have say six chargers running yeah. flat out for six, seven hours because yeah. you've got that big battery buffer. And that's the whole thing. It gives you that buffer because like here we're on a farm, lovely place, but our grid supply is place. limited. Yeah. You know, yeah. we've only got, I think we've got 200 amps of phase now, but when we started, we had 100 amps of phase, which to run all our machinery is just nowhere near enough. Yeah. So the cost to bring extra power, and I think it was nearly 80,000 pounds for the bigger transformer. Hmm. Whereas, you know, a small charge cube is sub 60,000 pounds. Yeah. That would have buffered our electric. So overnight it would have charged and in a day it would have given us yeah extra power back yeah. that's that's another thing it can do but right now we're heavily focused on sort of fleet and infrastructure because we just see right now that's the biggest hurdle to, to EVs yeah. and also they're the ones that do the most miles produce the most pollute, pollutants you know the people yeah. driving their car every day do five ten miles a day park up whereas you think the people out for in their vans are out consistently all the time mm. burning old dinosaurs yeah whereas yeah, we can give them a way to get to EV efficiently yeah. without the pain and the headaches and the extra cost of infrastructure that should really allow commercialization of EVs, I hope. Cool, yeah. It seems to be the last big hurdle. Yeah, and then once you've done the last big hurdles, you can focus on things like festivals and Correct. just like parties yeah. and stuff where you could just take these into the middle of the field and yep. then people have got a charging solution. Yeah, and um, put a stage on top of it and then they, but yeah. Yeah, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> so what about it going even further into the future then, as my brain always takes me, just into the sustainable energy aspect of it? So what about like wind turbines and solar canopies you could put yep. over it or something? So it's designed for wind and solar input already, with the oh. inverter we're using. One thing I really want to do is do like another cube on top with a wind turbine inside it. Oh, sweet. So it's just like a drop-on. <laughs> yeah. I'd really like to do that. And you could potentially stack them up higher because you've got this massive ballast on the bottom. Yeah. And so yeah, you've got wind, solar, input, yeah. It's already there. The other thing is it can do hybrid generation. So if you don't have enough power, you can have a generator mm -hmm. and then use that generator um, to come on offline at certain times throughout the day just to top the battery up. So you're not running a generator non-stop inefficiently. Yeah, you bring on yeah. your generator at per peak efficiency yeah. to just charge up the battery and then shut it down again and you yeah. run off the battery. So there's yeah. this hybrid generation side of things, which is something else I think would be really good. Yeah, you, you take care of all the battery management within as well then? What yes. about the software and everything like that? Yeah, we do all of that here. So yeah. currently, currently we're running Second Life Tesla batteries in there. So the BMS system and stuff is within the Tesla batteries is already amazing. Mm -hmm. We're just communicating with that. But then we're taking that data to our own VCU, handling it in a certain way to tell our inverter system how much power is available, what the voltages are for charging it all that stuff, all the safety systems there. And then all that data also goes through a computer system through either a Starlink or a SIM system up to the cloud. And then on a cloud server, we can basically continually pull the data. Yeah, so you can keep an eye on everything that's going yeah. on. So, yeah. so like, it, like the heat of the batteries, the Correct. safety aspects, things yeah. like that. Everything we can keep track of. Genius. And then because yeah. the chargers have something called OCPP, we get all the data from them. So we know what charge is being used, how much power it's pulled how much charging it's done. So in that way, and because they have feedback on like RFID tags, theoretically, every vehicle that charges could have its own tag for every driver. Mm. And then you know that driver or that van has taken this much charge for this period of time on this date. So you start building up this whole model and this whole data set around usage and how much it's being used, when it's mm. being used. That's the biggest thing we found is no one has the data. Trying to find out how much power you're using, no one seems yeah. to know. Same with generators. They put a big generator on a building site. They just know it's running. Yeah. But if you ask them how much power they pulled and how often they're pulling peak power, they have no idea because yeah. none of it's tracked. Yeah. So the benefit there is we can continually track all that and build that data up. And then when customers do come to us and go, we're going to put this fleet of vehicles in here, we can go, well, based on this data set from another one we've done with the same vans, this works. So yeah. we can sort of start actually building up rather than us we can do an educated guess right now based on calculations, yeah. but we can get a lot more exact and a lot more information on the use cases. Um, and maybe look at long term doing a mixed match. So you may have a DC charger and a load of AC chargers. Mm -hmm. So if you do have a bigger vehicle that needs charging faster, because some of these new vans that are going to come out are probably going to have a lot bigger battery packs long term. Or if you get a seven and a half tonner, you know, yeah. it's going to have a couple of hundred kilowatt hours of battery. You're going to want to charge that quicker than seven kilowatts or 22 kilowatts. You're going to want to get DC charging into that overnight yeah. instead. Yeah. How are you going to go about getting enough batteries then? Where do you get them from? So currently we are breakage yards. There's a lot. 
like from, oh, yeah. from salvage yeah. vehicles loads. We've also been having a lot of discussions with fleets because a lot of fleets are, have Teslas out on salary sacrifice for so many years, mm. but they're coming back in on 150, 200,000 miles and they're like, right, is it worth us reselling these? Or can we take the battery out, supply us the battery so we can give them a set price for every battery that they, they give us and then they know they've got a base value for the vehicle when it comes back off of rental. Mm. Same with vans, it's like a lot of the vans that get used for delivery, they'll come in and they'll be battered after three years because mm. they've been used for pa parcel delivery. They're not gonna resell that van, but if they can always sell us the pack for X amount, a thousand pounds of battery pack, there's always a residual value on the vehicle. Um, so that's gonna be a big deal. There's also loads of other Second Life US, another big Second Life battery location people don't think of is China. Everyone buys new batteries in China, no one thinks of Second Life from China. Right, yeah. But you think China have probably got it's the, big, worth, the worth most shipping. EVs in the world. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they still have accidents, they still have high mileage vehicles, and those batteries currently go through recycling. Yeah. But in theory, we could be bring in Second Life from China. So why has no one done this before then? Because it's, it's clearly a pretty big opportunity. Yeah, so we kept looking at the market for years going, someone's going to do this, we don't need to do it. And then years went by and we kept seeing no one doing it. And we've seen some people try and do it, but they've not entered it in the correct way, or they've done some energy storage, but not thought about the infrastructure to go with it. Or they've done everything with brand new batteries from China and no one's used Second Life. Obviously the market's changed in the last couple of years and there's been a lot more availability. Mm -hmm. But also alongside the EV batteries coming out, a lot more high voltage inverters have appeared on the market, whereas before every inverter was 48 volt for solar storage, all that stuff. Suddenly we've now got high voltage inverters that can do up to a thousand volts, which means after Second Life batteries suddenly can stay as they were, 400 or 800 volts, and go straight into the power electronics that's available. So that's really allowed this to now happen. But the key thing for us is Second Life is not easy. For most people, you need to understand EVs, you need to understand how the software works, the you know how to reverse engineer the CAN bus messages for the software to get the batteries to, to turn on as they are. <laughs> that it's not a, just the thing you go, oh, I can yeah. turn that battery on, it's, you know, what IDs, what messages, what do I need to send it to make it feel like it's still in a Tesla or it's still in a VW? Because mm. the battery, if not, gets very upset. So there's there's all those bits you've got to reverse engineer. You batteries, do you? <laughs> <laughs> you don't. So okay. we did, yeah, huge amount of reverse engineering around that, which obviously we've done over the years with the retrofit in the EV space, because we've always been using Tesla parts or other parts from other OEMs. So we've learned how to reverse engineer them, how they work, how they communicate. Yeah. So that's allowed us to go to Second Life and already know how to operate, how to bring it online, how to keep it happy, mm. which I think most people just have no idea even where to start no, with I, that stuff. I don't have any idea. <laughs> <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> I have lots well, of really good engineers that do know yeah. how. Yeah, well, there's to be plenty of people who are working here that yeah. uh, <laughs> you can at least call upon to ask, yes. I suppose. Um, so if anyone wants to uh, get in contact with you to, to organise uh, you know, leasing one of these from you, is that the thing? Would you buy them? or just, um, So just we are doing them? buy, lease and rent. So right, we're, we're okay. trying to keep it really open for people yeah. because I think the big issue is everywhere else you go, you have to buy them. That's mm -hmm. a huge amount of out, uh, outlay. It's a big capex cost to a company. So we're going actually, you can buy them if you want to, but we're doing a rental, which is like short term. Yeah. So that'd be weeks or months short term, and then a, maybe a longer term lease, which is like two to three year leasing. Because hmm. that really allows for a couple of different entry points price wise. Um, it also allows maybe someone will rent one for a couple of weeks, go actually, this is perfect. Can I now make it a lease item? Yeah. So it's giving people the chance to probably dabble and just go, let me just dip my toe in and see yeah. how see this the works. By renting it, it makes, yeah. makes perfect sense. And then it? once that works and they can see the benefits to the fleet and their charging infrastructure, mm -hmm. then potentially they'll move across to, yeah. to sort of a more permanent rental or lease. I know what I was going to ask you as well. What about the sort of vertical integration of what you're doing here as well? So you, you, I understand you get your containers yourself as, as well. and you, you Yes. Um, so we work with Tiny Containers, which are based in Avonmouth, but they're all over the world. Yeah. And what you find in the UK is the UK buys a lot of stuff in, but we export hardly anything. So when you think about sea containers, yeah. they come here, but they just sit here and oh, yeah. they end up being quite cheap or they get sent back empty. Yeah. Or they get sent back with probably rubbish and recycling into yeah, other countries. Yeah, plastic to burn in other countries. Yeah, exactly, like which that. is really bad. So the main thing is, is that those containers come in, they've done a single journey. Mm. So they're pretty much brand new, they've done one trip. So they'll then get either a cut down to become two 10 foot from a 20 foot, or we'll keep it as a 20 foot. And then we'll add in all the relevant boxes and holes that we need, repaint them, and then they'll become the charge cube. Out of interest, how much is one container, roughly, to, to um, buy a container? I think a 20 foot container, roughly, is probably about 4,000 ish pounds, something okay. like that. That's a lot of steel, though, isn't it? Yeah, you get a lot, a lot of, steel. of material for that. <laughs> so if you cut, okay. to it, cut it in half, you know, yeah. you can get two 10 foots out of it. Yeah, you've got to do 
sort of yeah. welding and work and stuff yeah. like that, but it's fairly it's just cost like effective. Metal version of a pallet, isn't it? It's like and then they're designed to last yeah. 25 years. Yeah, okay. So when you look at the, how robust they are, how sturdy they are, someone can drive into it and it's still fine. Mm. They can be lifted with high abs on and off trucks. They're just, they're such a, a uniform, it's like. Pretty diverse uh, yeah, use case, isn't it? For, yeah. for it? People have even turned them into houses as well. That's what I mean. It's <laughs> like, why would you go and design a really nice, pretty box? Yeah. When you Use can, what you've got. You can take something. Yeah. I mean, it's industrial. It doesn't necessarily look the prettiest, but everyone's so used to containers. Yeah. And everyone looks at them in a certain way and like, I know I can drop that in and just not worry about it. Yeah. And yeah. that's the key thing is yeah. to sort of give people that idea that they know it's robust, they know it's sturdy. Mm. Like even the little pavilions, if you look at them, they look like a container on end. And we designed it that way so it all fits aesthetically yeah. together. Yeah. Plus the pavilions are pretty sturdy so someone can reverse into it and yeah, it it'll probably do more damage to the car yeah. than it will to itself. Yeah, cool. Well, feel free to tell people where to go if they want to find out more. Yeah, so um, website is chargecube.com, but it's cube with a Q. And if you head on there, there's loads of information about ChargeCube. There's also um, some brochures on there about a couple of different versions we offer. So you can just reach out to the team here and we can get in contact and talk a little bit more detail about mm. how ChargeCube works. For people. Yeah, nice one. Well, look, great to chat to you. Um, thanks for showing me around your lovely facility here, and uh, best of luck with all the all the uh, charge cube future. Much. So yeah, nice one, Chris. Cheers. <laughs> oh, can we do a glass of water as well? Can I be a pain drone? Do you mind? Oh, yeah, cheers. They're coming right YouTube diva, this guy. Isn't it? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even use your toilet. <laughs> okay, can't <take> it. <laughs> Here's a couple more videos for your viewing pleasure. I'm Will, this is the Tesla Jigsaw. Thank you, Patreons. Thank you for watching. Bye for now.